running pretty much on time. I have obviously a presentation that's way too long. So I'm going to race through some of this stuff. Um, you will have the presentations available to you at the end of the, the whole course. Um, and I'm, I'll be around. You can always ask me questions if you have to. I prefer you didn't. Um, anyway, so as far as dissections, is there a, there's nothing to look at up here? Oh, over here. Okay. No, no, I, I, I got a, a different pointer here, yeah. Um, so if you look at just the definitions of uh, acute dissection, and I'm probably going to challenge some of these along the talk, um, but if you uh, know kind of standard what it, it, it uh, is defined as, acute is defined as somebody that has a dissection within 14 days of symptom onset, and then chronic beyond that. And that was really based on old data uh, way back from the 50s and really was, was uh, on, based on um, autopsy reports. Um, for a complicated dissection, we're going to talk about this several times throughout the talk. Um, essentially, end organ ischemia or malperfusion, as you know, refractory hypertension, uh, rupture or impending rupture, and then uncontrolled pain. Uh, and then, of course, there's the complicated, uncomplicated, rather, uh, dissections. Um, so we go with really two main classifications. Uh, the more simple is a Stanford type A is anything involved in the ascending, and type B is anything involved in the descending. And DeBakey kind of classifies it a little bit further into one and two, which involves the ascending, and then three A uh, and B, uh, the B being the more extensive of those two. Uh, as far as demographics, 80 to 90 percent of patients are 60 years or above uh, and have arterial hypertension. Um, acute dissections involve uh, the ascending in uh, patients who are generally a little bit younger. Uh, arch vessel occlusion, uh, about 5 to 10 percent of those with type A dissections. Um, if you look at patients who have uh, dissections overall, <clears throat> if they're going to have ischemia of a leg, it's generally the, the left leg, um, and so that's where you should be falling. Interestingly enough, a lot of times you may have a stronger pulse in that left side, although that's where they're complaining of symptoms. Um, of course, they may have uh, become anur anuric or uh, have decrease in their uh, urine output. Um, <clears throat> and then hemodynamic state, of course, they can have sudden death, and this would be a free rupture of uh, their false lumen. Uh, they can have acute aortic insufficiency and cardiac tamponade, all things you should be looking for. Uh, as far as type A dissections, uh, of course, you know that they are emergencies, and we consider about 1% uh, mortality rate per hour. Uh, operative repair still has a pretty high mor mortality rate, and uh, that's about 30%. Uh, generally, you want to do the least possible, and so most of the time that's just an ascending replacement. Uh, sometimes you'll have to suspend the valve. Of course, you'll know going in uh, whether that valve is incompetent. Generally, generally, your anesthesiologist will be doing a TEE for you. Uh, the complications are significant, um, stroke, bleeding, death, uh, multi-system uh, organ failure, and MI. Seems like with all these talks, we're really trying to encourage you to go into vascular. Uh, unfortunately, you've already committed yourself. Uh, <clears throat> symptoms and signs, uh, the most common are sudden severe uh, back and chest pain. Uh, generally, most patients will describe it between their shoulder blades. That's about 90 percent or greater. Uh, pain into the abdomen, so uh, that could actually be misleading. You may think it's something else. Uh, and that is related to the aortic tear uh, or mesenteric ischemia. Uh, hypertension, of course, is uh, 70 percent or greater uh, in distal dissections and less than 50 percent proximal. <clears throat> You may also see syncope in 15 to 20 percent of patients. Um, <clears throat> if you go through some of the diagnostics, of course you can do a chest x-ray, you can see widening of the mediastinum as you see in that picture, uh, but that's not obviously your mainstay in how you're going to diagnose these. Uh, contrast CT is probably the most common, uh, and then uh, echo or TE, uh, particularly for type A dissections. Um, and then if you were going to look at some of the sensitivities, you can see there for a TE. Uh, sensitivity uh, ranges between 96 and 100 percent, and specific specificity around 86 to 100 uh, percent. And that's essentially what it would look like if you used IVIS. You can you also know what it looks like when you're uh, when you're doing that with a catheter. You see that flap um, that's uh, mobile uh, within your uh, ultrasound image. Um, CT scans are obviously the most widely used, and that's because they're easy to do. Uh, they're available everywhere. Uh, you're not dependent on um, kind of technicians that are uh, only there during daytime hours. Um, it's quick um, and relatively inexpensive. Uh, as far as MRI, it's probably the best imaging modality, at least uh, uh, it has been in our hands, and uh, there's definitely some data supporting that. Uh, 
uh, if you look at this study um, done uh, back some years ago now, uh, but really uh, probably the most sensitive of the four imaging modalities used for uh, dissections. Uh, what is the rationale of treatment? Uh, well, once a, a presence of dissection is established, uh, you need to have some information uh, for, from the imaging modalities you're using. So one is you need to know the extension of the dissection. Uh, you need to know which branch vessels are involved uh, and how they're involved, uh, proximal and distal entry sites, uh, septal mobility and dynamic branch vessel obstruction. I'll show you how that, what that looks like. Uh, true and false lumen filling patterns, uh, false lumen thrombosis. Uh, you, you may know or not know that partial uh, false lumen thrombosis is um, really uh, linked to poor outcomes in, in, in these patients. Of course, rupture, uh, but likely you'll know that from your hemodynamic status, and then uh, aortic dimensions. <clears throat> um, if just quickly, there are uh, different ways this can appear. It can appear as both a static and a dynamic uh, vessel compromise, uh, depending on when, whether there is some thrombus along that uh, false lumen extending into some of those branches. Uh, if you look here, you can see on the top image, which is what you're going to get. If you get a static image, you're going to think your vessels are open. If you look that down below in kind of a more dynamic uh, projection, you can see that there's invagination of the septum into those branch vessels. And if you have a patient who has symptoms, you can understand why when you see those pictures, although you probably couldn't understand why if you saw the pictures up above, and you'd probably manage that conservatively. Again, here, just to show how dramatic it can be uh, when you see some of these dissections in a more dynamic um, way. Of course, you realize that these, the aorta is an organ like any other organ, and there's something happening all the time. And this can change quickly uh, as these dissections evolve, sometimes over hours to days. Um, if you look at this, an old study uh, based on, on some uh, imaging uh, criteria, and essentially there were two basic components, ischemic and benign uh, configurations for dissections, just something to keep an eye on when you're looking at your, uh, your imaging. Um, here, just some MR that you guys probably aren't used to seeing, but really high resolution uh, contrast MR, and you can see just as well as you can in a, um, in a CT, although uh, clearly a CT gives you better um, uh, spatial resolution. And we'll show you some of those here in a second. Again, here you can see clearly your entry tear, uh, and uh, uh, these are things that you should be looking for. We essentially looked at all our uh, uh, MRs and found uh, three different forms of um, uh, flow through these dissections. Uh, type 1, which is really a very benign uh, configuration where the flow is equal through both the true and false lumen. Uh, type 2, which essentially is a uh, dissection where you see anti-grade uh, flow and then slow flow through the false lumen, but the false lumen uh, pressure stays high because it doesn't <coughs> empty well through that uh, re-entry tear. And then the opposite on the, on the type 3 where it's really a retrograde uh, flow into the false lumen. You can see how that hangs up at the end. Again, a, a high pressure circumstance in the false lumen. Uh, this is a ECG gated CTA, and you can see you can see a lot of the same dynamic components, uh, and obviously very important. But you can do this in CT. It's a little more refined on the MR, as we showed you, which is really a cardiac MR protocols. If you are to look at aortic dissections, as far as uh, how to uh, how to look at it by, um, uh, there are always some. Uh, blood parameters you can you can look at here really D dimer uh, as far as biomarkers becomes the most important uh, if it's above 500 here just a little um, uh, flow chart here if it's above 500 you should consider that there is a dissection um, not all uh, ERs are used to doing this but it's definitely something you can use uh, for type B dissections really the uh, mainstay is uh, in the ICU pain control and anti-impulse therapy um, and then uh, eventually once you uh, manage that conservatively, you want to switch over to PO medications, uh, discharge on, on antihypertensives, and then CTs as uh, outlined there. Uh, indications for interventions we already spoke about. In the chronic phase, you look for aneurysmal degeneration of the outer false lumen, um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, then essentially the groups at risk, uh, central con continued patency of the false lumen flow is demonstrated as a risk factor. Pul partial false lumen thrombosis, as I said earlier, is a risk factor for poor outcomes. Uh, 40 to 50 percent of the patients will require some, some form of aneurysm resection. Uh, the therapeutic spectrum, 
Um, uh, as far as surgery, obviously type A, we said you know, all those get surgery. Uh, you can have acute type Bs with retrograde dissection. Also, when you stent them, uh, that can be one of the complications. That, and then you convert it into an open operation. Uh, and then uh, for most uh, uh, patients, they will go through medical therapy for type Bs in uncomplicated types, uh, in uncomplicated situations. And then, of course, for uh, most uh, complicated or unstable acute type Bs, you'll have uh, an interventional um, uh, modality to treat those patients, and primarily that's T-VARS or co some combination of fenestration and so on. Um, I'm going to go through some of this a little bit faster here. Um, overall, in-hospital mortality is about 29.3%. Uh, if surgery performed less than 48 hours after initial symptoms, it's 392 and then a little bit lower uh, beyond that. Um, motivation to treat. Uh, this is just to really show that as patients get older, obviously they don't do as well, no matter what modality you use. And then uh, really pain uh, in that slide, in that uh, diagram on your left side, uh, all high-risk patients are excluded. And the only thing you're looking at here is uh, intractable pain, and those patients have significantly worse outcomes, so not something to be ignored for sure. Uh, let me go through some of this stuff. Oh, we do? Oh, oh okay, great. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll go. Uh, so initial medical therapy, um, these are some of the medications that you can use. Um, but ultimately, what the goal is to maintain systolic blood pressure uh, between 100 and 120 millimeters of mercury, uh, maintain a heart rate below or equal to 60. Uh, the IRAD data basically says that 73% of patients managed uh, conservatively. Uh, there's a 10% in-hospital mortality. 60 to 80 percent survival rate at four to five years, and then 40 to 45 percent survival rate at 10 years, which is not bad. Uh, timing a stent graft, um, if it's the chronic phase, uh, generally uh, is uh, less attractive and much more attractive in the acute or subacute phase. And, and that probably may change a little bit over time as we study this more, but essentially complete obliteration and resolution of the false lumen following endovascular uh, stent graft treatment is more frequently achieved. Uh, when you treat these patients in a more acute phase. Um, I just want to go through two trials I think are important for you guys to know, uh, and that's, of, of course, the INSTEAD trial. Um, and then, um, you know, what you know from the INSTEAD trial is these are the most important things. There was no difference in uh, all-cause all uh, deaths. Uh, Two-year survival uh, also was equal between the groups. Um, and essentially no difference, uh, no advantage really to uh, stent grafting these patients. But what you have to know is these patients were mixed. Um, it wasn't powered, the study wasn't powered properly. Uh, and so uh, really this, this is just should push us to, to understand the pathology a little bit better and which patients really need to be stented and which ones don't. The ADSORB trial is the other trial that's important. It's a GORE-sponsored trial. Uh, the primary study endpoints were incomplete or no false lumen thrombosis at one year, aortic dilatation uh, at one year, and then descending thoracic or abdominal aortic rupture through the one-year follow-up. Um, and what you can see is that essentially um, uh, true lumen uh, max size increases after stent grafting over best medical therapy. Um, and then here, the false lumen size decreases significantly in the tag group versus best medical therapy. Uh, false lumen thrombosis at one year uh, of 30 TAG devices and best medical therapy, 56.7% uh, had complete false lumen thrombosis, 13.3% had none or partial, and then 30% had uh, imaging unavailable, uh, like is very, very commonly the, the case in our patients, uh, and I think you'll see the same thing, is most of your patients don't come back. Uh, they come from far away. Uh, some of them just uh, aren't motivated to come back, and so you know, oftentimes we have incomplete uh, records in a lot of these patients, which makes studying them very, very difficult. Of the best medical therapy alone, uh, only 3.2% had complete uh, thrombosis of the false lumen, which is obviously a huge difference. 64.5% um, had none or partial thrombosis, and then down there, 30% equally. Um, this is just to say that we are extending into the chest. This is a study that uh, we're doing here in the medical center th uh, through three centers, with Dr. Caselli, Dr. Safi, and ourselves, uh, where we're essentially um, uh, treating uh, the ascending dissection with stent grafts, uh, and hopefully we'll get some results out of this in the next few years.
And so in conclusion, I think this is a relatively rare pathology with potentially grave consequences. Uh, medical therapy still works and should be the treatment of choice in uncomplicated dissections. I think don't, don't feel you need to treat everybody with stent graft because that's also not without complications. You heard Dr. Lumsden's talk, and that's very much the case here as well. Um, as far as endovascular repair, it's definitely probably the mainstay now for uh, type B dissections, and who knows, it may be the mainstay for type A dissections down the road. Um, open surgical repair, repair remains a valid option in chronic dissections and should definitely be considered um, as, uh, as such. Thank you very much.